Hello, I'm Joe Bolduc and welcome to this video on pathogens. The purpose of this video is to give you a general understanding of what makes a microorganism pathogenic. So if you recall, there are tons and tons of microbes out in the world, but only 1% of them are considered pathogenic. That means that they're harmful to another living organism. So I'm going to begin by comparing pathogens with non-pathogenic microorganisms. From the moment that we're born, we're constantly coming in contact with millions of microorganisms every day. Luckily for us, the majority of these microorganisms are going to be non-pathogenic. That means they're not going to cause any harm to us. Some of them are going to stick to the outside of our body on our skin, whereas others might enter our body and stick to the mucosal layers that line our internal cavities, as, I'm labeled, as I've labeled them here on this slide. They're going to be a mixture of bacteria, some fungi, and some archaea. But together, they're going to form what we call a normal flora. This is the population of microorganisms that exist on our body that has a symbiotic relationship with us. That means we're both going to benefit from our presence with each other. These microorganisms are going to provide us with nutrients that we don't otherwise have, some important vitamins, and they're also going to help our body, especially our intestines, to develop normally. As we go on from one month to another, these, this normal flora will vary. Again, it depends on the foods we eat, the environment that we come in contact with. So the normal flora is not something that once we acquire it, that it stays uh, permanent. It's something that will evolve as we go along through life. But as we constantly come in contact with other microorganisms, our normal flora are going to compete for these binding sites and prevent other organisms from binding. More importantly, they will help protect us from pathogenic organisms from binding to our bodies. Now, the random pathogenic organisms that we'll come in contact with will be other bacteria, viruses, fungi, as well as some protists. They won't share what we call a symbiotic relationship. They're going to have a parasitic uh, relationship. That means that only they will benefit at the expense of our body or the body of uh, the, the host. So as these organisms require the host, they're going to take nutrients from the host, undergo metabolic processes, uh, dispose of metabolic waste. Their presence is going to have some harmful effect on the host. It's going to cause, lead to the cause of diseases and sometimes even death of the host. Before I move to the next microbe host interaction involvement, I'd like to define the terms disease and infectious disease that I just presented in the previous slide. The term disease is defined as the disorder of function in the living organism that negatively affects the host's well-being. So if an organ or a function of the body or the host does not function correctly, the body will quickly become ill. If it's severe enough, then that person or that, that body will eventually die. The term infectious disease is if that disease is caused by the mere presence of a pathogenic microorganism in the host, then now that disease is considered an infectious disease. An example is Streptococcus pneumoniae, which is a bacteria that we can inhale and it could enter our lungs. Now recall our lungs should normally be sterile. However, in the presence of this bacteria, our lungs will build up some fluid. If fluid enters, we, our body doesn't exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide very well. Therefore, we have trouble breathing, and eventually we could even die of pneumonia. Okay, so now let's go to the next slide and talk about the third microbe host interaction. So under normal healthy conditions, there are microbes that exist on your body that cannot cause disease. However, under certain conditions, if your body weakens, under the opportune moment, these organisms can become pathogenic. An example of this is the bacteria Staphylococcus aureus. Now Staphylococcus aureus is a member of the normal flora of your skin and of your nares. While the body is healthy, these organisms do not cause any harm. They reside in your skin. Sometimes they'll leave and come back later. However, you don't even know they're there. Remember your skin is the best mode of defense against disease, infectious diseases. 
If your skin is breached by a cut or a wound, the moment that that organism enters your blood, it now becomes a pathogen. The conditions have changed to make it from a non-pathogenic organism to a pathogenic organism. So let's compare that with a pathogen. A pathogen will always cause disease uh, no matter what, but an opportunistic pathogen has to have the right conditions in order for it to become pathogenic. So it's an opportunistic organism. Our skin is not the only mode of defense that we have to protect us against pathogens. For example, our internal cavities are coated by mucus. Mucus is a protective film that prevents microbes from binding to these cells. Also in our mouth, we produce saliva, which has an acid pH and also contains enzymes that can help degrade some microbes. Our stomach and urine both have acid conditions, so if microbes were to present themselves in these areas, they would also uh, be, de be destroyed by pH. Bile and intestines produce enzymes. These enzymes uh, can also um, be a mode of defense as well as our normal flora. So remember our normal flora is found on the surface, on our skin, as well as the mucosal membranes that line our internal cavities. This normal flora helps prevent pathogens from binding because they compete for binding sites. Also our normal flora will compete for nutrients and can also secrete antibiotics. So if, they had, if the pathogens are susceptible to those antibiotics, this is a great way of defending us, ourselves. Also, we have macrophage and other professional phagocytic cells that are inside our bodies that are looking for foreign objects. They're ready to phagocytize them and digest them. As a foreign object, such as a microbe, enters our body, our immune system is constantly looking, uh, looking to destroy them and to mount an immune response. So we have a whole target or a whole team of defense mechanisms that are helping prevent us from disease. In order for a microorganism to be pathogenic, it has to secrete some molecules that we call virulence factors. Now, this is a group of molecules. They all have different effects, but the net result is that they allow the pathogen to stay long enough in the host to cause disease, infectious disease. As an example, a virulence factor might help the pathogen colonize a certain area of the host. So to do this, it would have to allow the pathogen to bind stronger or compete for a binding site with your normal flora. If it stays, if it binds to the cells, it's going to stay there long enough. It's going to require nutrients. It's going to colonize. It's going to cause harm. A second example of what a virulence factor could do is it might help the pathogen enter inside a host cell. Now, this is a good way to avoid your immune system. It also is a good way to help the organism spread from one area of the host to another by just hiding out within the cells. Lastly, a virulence factor could help the pathogen acquire nutrients that usually is trapped inside the host cells. So to do this, the virulence factor would have to destroy the host cells, release the nutrients, and allow the pathogen to grow. So in either case, the result is that it's toxic to the host, the pathogen is going to grow at the host's expense. So up to this point, I've introduced pathogens. I've compared them to non-pathogenic microorganisms that compose your normal flora. And I've also described you what makes a, an organism pathogenic. So now I want to discuss the steps of infection and of disease. Now the first step for all infections is for the pathogen to enter the host. It's going to do this through a specific route. We're going to call that route the portal of entry. Some pathogens will only have one portal of entry, whereas others might have two or more. Now, if they have two or more, then there's going to be a difference in diseases depending on which portal of entry they enter the host. Now, the portal of entry for many pathogens is that of the mucous membrane. We're going to take them in our bodies when we breathe the air through our nose and our mouth and when we eat and drink. They're going to gain access to the lungs. Remember, the lungs should normally be sterile. Or they're going to enter into our gastrointestinal tract, for example, our stomach and our intestines. Some are then going to enter via the genitourinary tract during sexual contact, and they're going to be associated with sexually transmitted infections. 
the next common portal of entry is going to be through our skin. So if we have a broken skin or a skin abscess, this can lead to an infection below the skin. And the third portal of entry is known as the parental route. This route bypasses the skin and allows direct entry of the pathogen into the blood. Examples of parental route are puncture wounds, injections, insect bites, wounds, and surgery. So now that the microorganism has entered the body through its portal of entry, it's reached a part of the body that normally should be sterile. So we're going to call this an infection. The infection has started. The organism is going to adhere to the surface of the cells. It's going to start feeding. That means it's going to metabolize. It's going to excrete metabolic waste. It's going to grow and multiply into larger numbers. Now remember the definition of disease. Disease is when an organ or a structure of the body doesn't function correctly. That might not have started yet. Whereas you have an infection, you might not have had a disease already. Disease will come later when the numbers of organisms grow large enough that they will obstruct the function of that organ or that structure of the body. So let's talk about the virulence factors that allows the microorganism or the pathogen to adhere. It's going to be very important for a pathogen to be able to adhere to the surface of a host cell. Otherwise, the host could simply eliminate that bacteria or that microbe from the, from the body and prevent disease. So if a pathogen has an adhesin, has a surface component that allows it to bind to the surface of a cell, as I'm showing you here, it's going to allow that pathogen to stick around long enough so that it can acquire nutrients, grow and multiply. Now, I'm showing you a picture of a bacteria. The term adhesin is specific to that of bacteria. However, other pathogens such as viruses We'll have similar appendages, but instead of calling them adhesins, we're going to call them ligands. But either way, the first step of infection, or the, I should say the second step after entry, is that of binding. So these pathogens have to bind to the surface of a cell. While not a virulence factor, another factor that we have to consider that will allow a pathogen to cause disease is the number of pathogens that enter the host cell. So obviously, the more pathogenic cells that enter the host, the, more, the greater the likelihood that a disease will occur. If that number reduces to a certain point, then the body can, have, can mount a defense mechanism and prevent disease. So we're going to describe a pathogen by its degree of pathogenicity. Microbiologists use the term virulence. So I'm giving you an example of two different pathogenic microorganisms. On the left is the red pathogen, and on the right is the yellow pathogen. Now, in order to reproducibly cause disease in the host, it requires at least four red pathogenic cells to enter the host. Likewise, to reproducibly cause disease in, in the same host, it requires about 37 of the orange uh, pathogenic cells to cause disease. Knowing that, we can say that the red pathogen is more virulent than that of the yellow uh, yellow pathogen. Why is that important? Well, you're more likely to come across four cells as opposed to 37, so you're more likely to get disease each time you come in contact with the red pathogen than you are with the yellow pathogen because it requires more cells. So it's very important for microbiologists to characterize pathogens as being mildly pathogenic or extremely pathogenic or something in between. So as I said, numbers count, and virulence basically refers to the number or the degree of pathogenicity. Now, this term virulence is going to come into play with many factors, so it's not just one thing. It's going to depend on the ability of the pathogen to enter the host, as I've said, its ability to adhere, its ability to hide from the immune system, uh, its ability to damage host tissue, and as well as its ability to ex exit the host. So remember, its goal is not just to harm the host or to kill the host, because that doesn't serve a purpose. It needs to move on, so it also needs to leave the host. So a strong pathogenic microorganism is going to have a number of these virulence factors, and it's going to require or acquire, allow it to simply cause disease with fewer cells. So scientists are not going to rely on just adjectives to describe how virulent one pathogen is to another. They're going to rely on numbers. That number is going to be 
represented as ID50. ID stands for infectious dose 50. And this will be done in a lab. Usually it requires a population of lab animals that are that can be infected with the pathogen. So in this case, I'll represent that the pathogen as E. coli 0157H7. And I'm going to have five populations of animals. Okay. Within each population, there will be a 100 animals. This is extremely large, but it's just to make a point. Okay, so we have 500 animals. In the first population, you have to have a control. You're not going to give any pathogen, so no E. coli. The second one, you'll give five. You're going to give next 10 pathogenic cells for, to each animal. Here, you're going to give maybe 50 uh, pathogenic cells per animal, and here, 100. Okay. What you're looking for is for 50% of the population that will become infected, hence the 50 and ID 50. And since the number up here says that it takes 10 cells, in this case, we would represent that out of the 100 animals in this population that receive 10 pathogenic cells, 50% of the animals or 50 of the animals acquire disease. So if you were to do the same, uh, give only five organisms, less than 50 animals would get infected zero you wouldn't expect any uh, if you gave more than 10 then obviously more than half the animals got infected so maybe 75 percent so this would be id 75 and 100 all animals got infected this would be id 100. in order to be better represented or more reproducible id 50 is the ideal uh, number that scientists look for so Scientists have looked in the lab, they've compared that um, the ID50 for E. coli 0157H7 is 10 pathogenic cells. Compare that with the other pathogen, Salmonella enteritidis, in which it takes 100,000 cells. So you can say that E. coli, in this particular strain of E. coli, it is a thousand times more virulent than that of Salmonella enteritidis. So again, you have specific values. So ID50 stands for infectious dose 50. It is the, the amount of pathogens required to cause infection in 50% of the population being tested. So at this point, infection has occurred, diseases has started. Few organisms will actually grow at that initial site. Others might migrate to other parts of the body. They might even do this by entering the blood. The blood's a good uh, route for them to, for these pathogens to go from one organ to another. In that case, we will call it a systemic infection. Other path some pathogens will stay inside host cells. That's great because they can avoid the immune system. Others will grow in bodily fluids. So different pathogens will have different ways of, of uh, will have different needs. And because of that, they will cause different types of infectious diseases. The longer that a pathogen hangs out in the host cell, the more chances that the host will recognize it and mount an immune response or a defense response against that pathogen. So I've listed here four ways, different ways in which a pathogen can avoid that host response. And I'm gonna start by talking about capsules. One role of the capsule is to prevent phagocytosis. So in order to understand that, we need to first talk about phagocytic cells. Phagocytic cells are a defense mechanism. These are cells that basically circulate throughout the host body and it's looking for foreign objects. To the left here, I have two microbes that were detected by a phagocytic cell. It came in contact through receptors and ligands. It recognizes that these, the surface of this microbe is foreign. So it's going to wrap around that microorganism. It's going to internalize it. It's going to phagocytize it and kill it. So this is a good example of a non-pathogenic microorganism because it's detectable by the defense mechanism and the host can destroy it. If we had a, a similar um, pathogen or a similar microbe, but this microbe is now expressing a capsule around it. Now these capsules are polysaccharides in nature, but what they're doing is they're cloaking the organism. They're preventing the phag phagocytic cell from sampling the surface and seeing it as foreign. So as a result, the organisms are able to uh, 
locate a certain site is able to grow and metabolize and cause harm to the body. So capsules are a very good virulence factor and they prevent the, the host from recognizing them as being foreign. The next component on my list is biofilms. Biofilms are going to be similar to that of capsules. They're both called glycocalyxes, but capsules are, are well organized around the microorganisms, whereas biofilms are just loosely surrounded. So let's take a look closer at biofilms. Similar to capsules, biofilms are not always being produced. They will mostly be made when the microorganism recognizes certain cellular receptors or if there's a certain nutrition in the area. So nutritional cues and environmental stimuli will tell the microorganism when it should produce that biofilm. The microbes that are able to produce a biofilm will only do so when certain, uh, when certain requirements are met. One of those requirements is when they attach to certain cell receptors. This will then stimulate the cell to produce, start producing a biofilm. Other such stimulants will be environmental factors such as pH and nutrition, uh, I'm sorry, pH and temperature, or certain nutrients that might be in the area that will also stimulate biofilm production. Now, if you recall, biofilm is a carbohydrate molecule. These carbohydrates when wet are sticky. So they will surround the organisms and they will allow the organisms to stick to the surface. These are four cells that have started to produce a biofilm. This biofilm is covering these cells. Other microorganisms are coming in the vicinity and they will also stick to the biofilm, even though they, they themselves did not produce the biofilm. As the biofilm producing pathogens are you know, continue, continuing to grow, they will produce more biofilms, more and more microorganisms will develop. Now, those that are deeper into the, bio, into the biofilm will have anaerobic conditions. These are conditions where there's very little oxygen reaching them, whereas those on the surface will be more aerobic. A good example of this happening in our body is when bacteria attach to the, the surface of our teeth, um, they start producing a biofilm and more and more bacteria will attach. Eventually, these bacteria keep multiplying, they metabolize, they produce lactic acid, this lactic acid deteriorates the enamel on our teeth and poke holes. They cause dental caries. Now the next example on this slide is that of enzymes. But recall, there are many enzymes and every enzyme is specific in their function. So in particular, I'm talking about enzymes that will help the pathogen uh, evade from the host defense mechanisms. So I have two examples. One is an example of enzymes that allow the, the pathogen to travel deeper or penetrate deeper inside tissue. So these enzymes, for example, might allow the, the pathogen to travel in between cells. So it might uh, break apart certain components of the host and allow the, the um, pathogen to travel deeper. The second example would be enzymes that are, allow the pathogen to be separated or walled off from the defense mechanism. So therefore, macrophage, as an example, would never be able or lymphatic cells would never be able to come in contact with the microorganism. So in either case, these specific enzymes help separate the enzyme, oh, I'm sorry, the pathogens from the host defense mechanism, allowing them to grow and cause disease. And the last example I have is that of invasins. Now invasins are surface molecules. They're expressed on the surface of pathogens. They sometimes allow the pathogen to bind, but more importantly, they allow the pathogen to enter inside cells. They allow pathogens to invade, hence the name invasins. Like that of adhesins, invasins need to bind to a certain cell receptor. When it does that, it'll send internal signals that begin cell membrane ruffling and starts the process of endocytosis. Once inside the cell, the pathogen can move through the cell and exit the opposite end, helping the organism to penetrate the host and move away from its portal of entry. Other pathogens, once they enter, they're able to escape the internal vesicles and begin to grow and multiply inside the host cells. Example of these are Salmonella and Shigella. They can migrate from one cell to another without ever really exist exiting from the cells. 
This is going to help them hide from the host defense mechanisms. So it's a very good virulence factor. While another group of pathogens that express invasin on their surface use them to migrate between cells as opposed to through cells. And either way, invasins allow pathogens to spread the infection throughout the host. Regardless whether the organism stays close to its portal of entry or if it migrates through the use of invasins throughout the body, its overall goal is to find a suitable environment for it to, to find plenty of nutrients, the right temperature, the right pH, the right amount of oxygen, et cetera, et cetera, so that it can grow. While it grows and multiplies, it's going to use up the host's nutrients. It's going to metabolize and it's going to secrete out metabolic waste. Likewise, they can produce toxins that are harmful to the host. Now, we know of about 200 toxins. They are specific. They are usually protein in nature. There are also a, a group of toxins that are uh, lipopolysaccharide in nature. So they're, they're lipid in nature. We'll talk more about toxins in another, another video. Lastly, pathogens can induce hypersensitivity reactions. Lastly, while the organism was busy growing and uh, being pathogenic or parasitic to the host, its goal is not to remain in the host, but then to exit and spread on to other hosts. So it needs to find a portal of exit. Sometimes this portal of exit can be the same as the portal of entry. Sometimes it would be a different portal. But just like the portal of entries, the portal of exits that are known are that of the mucous membrane, the skin, and by parental roots. Out of the three portal of exits, the mucosal membrane is the easiest to, uh, to escape the, the host, and it's easily transmissib transmissible to another host. So we're going to talk about transmission next. Transmission is the transfer of pathogens from one host to another. This can be done directly, direct contact. Now, if a pathogen is easily transmissible from one or transferred from one host to another, then we're going to say that that pathogen is highly contagious. Person to person is an example. Another example of direct transmission is that of animal to person. In this case, when an animal is one of the hosts, then we're going to call that disease a zoonose disease. The next type of, of transmission involves an indirect transmission. It in, involves non-living organisms, such as fomites, vectors, air, and water. Now, an example of an indirect spreading of a pathogen uh, using a fomite could be uh, towels at a healthcare facility where uh, sterility of the towels is not done correctly. It could also be in locker rooms uh, at sport events. Another uh, example is sharing toothbrushes. So a toothbrush would be that fomite, that inanimate object. Vectors, another, an example of vectors are mosquitoes. Mosquitoes transfer malaria from one host to another. Uh, air, pathogens are, are floating in the air as well as water. Some water could get contaminated with pathogens. These are all indirect forms of transmission. So let's summarize this lecture. I've talked about pathogens, I've compared them to non-pathogenic organisms, I've told you what made uh, a microorganisms pathogenic, that they had to express certain virulence factors on them, talked about what these virulence factors do, talked about how we can measure virulence by measuring the ID50. We talked about how these pathogens enter the host through their portal of entry, once they're in, they, have to, they sometimes spread throughout the body, but they have to adhere, they have to grow and multiply. They secrete virulence factors that are toxic to the host. Once they're in the host, they do have to exit, so they have to find their portal of exit so that they can be transmissible from one host to another. I gave you the definition of an infection, and I gave you also the definition of a disease. You don't have to have a disease if you have an infection, but you, you always have to have an infection first before you can have a disease. Again, lastly, we just talked about transmission. So that's it for this lecture. I hope it was helpful, and I hope to see you again for my other lectures.